Welcome to the Earth Feels Podcast. I'm Rose. And I'm Christine. Welcome to Earth Feels, the podcast for people feeling overwhelmed by the endlessly gloomy climate news. Where every week we have soul-based conversations about climate change and explore the idea that climate change may be happening for us as much as it is happening to us. If you are ready to shift your focus and secure the future for our kids and our grandkids, then this is the podcast for you. And yes, we do know how to spell. (laughs) Hey, it's Rose here. If there's one thing I think we can all agree on, it's that we are living in a time of divisiveness. Democrat versus Republican white people of color, matriarchy versus patriarchy, colonists versus the indigenous, CEOs versus workers, the wealthy, the impoverished. And then it goes deeper to head versus heart. Where do you live? Left brain versus right brain. The differences are stark. And the past four years have only served to emphasize those disparities. Somehow, we must find a way back to each other. Certainly, the current climate crisis is calling us to put our heads together, to collaborate. We're at our best when we collaborate. So to that end, today's question is, how can we use the climate crisis to unite us? And to help answer that question, my guest for today is Dana Simpson, author of newly released Come Together, a handbook to retool for the future. Dana is a lifelong environmentalist and a climate change activist. She's written and illustrated 14 books and worked with many companies internationally to design home decor and products. Personally, I find her ceramics to be stunning. She and her husband live in a 200-year-old house on an island in the Chesapeake Bay where the abundant wildlife and natural beauty inspire her daily. She actually drives with the tide clock on the dash of her car, so she lets the fish and the blue crabs have the right of way. Welcome, Dana. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. You begin your book with a quote from Wendell Berry that I'd like to read. He says, we have lived our lives by the assumption that what was good for us would be good for the world. We have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it is possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. And that requires that we make the effort to know the world and learn what is good for it. I love that. It's it's like we've forgotten what's good for the world. Yes. Yeah. And I think that especially here in America, but really across the world, people, when they get more affluent and comfortable and ensconced in their lifestyle, they turn in rather than out. And I think people have gotten, there's been sort of a trend of thinking about the self over the collective Mm. for really the last 50 years. It's it's increased and increased and increased. Well, that has made a lot of things go down the tubes a little bit, you know, in terms of how we think about the future and each other and what we're doing today. Yeah, it does feel like we're in service to the self as opposed to service to the collective, whether that collective is humanity or the earth and all sentient beings. It's like, I got mine. I'm okay. And the hell with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen that in politics. So recently, um, (laughs) we're, we're, I think we're, we're beyond shocked. We're jarred. And I mean, it's literally for me, it's been like a movie that's gone off the rails Mm -hmm. to to see, um, you know, the attack on the Capitol ramming Supreme Court justices through as we're going to vote, the way that people are using their power for the self and for their own agendas, it's very much undermined 
our democracy, and it's certainly undermined for many years, our environment. The fossil fuel industry has been trying to manipulate everybody in policy and legislation for their own ends and profits. Right? And doing a pretty good job of it. Sadly, yeah. And you see right now, especially with plastics, this is a fossil fuels plan B. Mm -hmm. So they're not selling as much gas. So they're really trying to ramp up the plastic use, which is, oh my goodness, it is, it's such a scourge on our earth. And as we look around and we see this just floating on all of our water and in the ditches and animals becoming entangled in it. And what is it? It's something that a company is making a profit on and they're marketing it to us. And we are sort of blindly purchasing it and bringing it into our homes. So we're part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this past week I had um, an episode with a woman that I talked to from the UK, and she's also just released a book, and it's about the consumer-led movement, how it's going to have to be a grassroots. It's going to have to come from the bottom up because the top, they're already fat and happy. It's, you know, they're, they're living in their wealthy enclaves and the actual people that are, that are out here living day-to-day life are feeling it. Well, and not only, you know, it's not people with a lot of money that are the problem and they can actually get on the bus with the rest of us. And that's actually what come together is about the notion that for us to tackle this climate issue that is so huge and overwhelming for many people, we need to come together and speak together in a civilized and respectful way to understand, you know, what steps we can take instead of trying to undermine each other constantly. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, when I was originally thinking about writing the book, I've always been an environmentalist. I always have tried to figure out how to use my skill set to work for the movement. And it just, I said, well, I guess it's time to write a book. I was at a friend's house and I really like him. He's a smart guy. And yet he was very into Trump. So this was sort of like midway through Trump's regime. And I just had to hold myself back, take myself back, you know, down a couple of notches and say, well, tell me about that. You know, why do you feel this way? And I began to engage him. And it was kind of an interesting thing to me in my head to notice that instead of a free flowing dialogue, how I might normally have done it, I was being careful and figuring out how to engage him so that we could talk together and not necessarily try to change him, but for me to understand where he was coming from. Mm -hmm. I feel like he's actually changed his tune, especially over the last bunch of months. But that was how I decided to start the book. Because if we can't come together to work towards a healthy planet, uh, this issue affects everyone Mm -hmm. beyond race, gender, you know, religion, everything, Mm -hmm. you know, this is the beginning for us to learn to talk and act. Yeah. And there's something, I I like what you're saying. There's something about taking the emotion out of it, which is not easy to do because it affects you on such a heart level or affects me on such a heart level. It hurts my heart when people are spew vitriol and hatred and just uh, whatever. But if you can kind of switch your mindset to curiosity Curiosity of, we're all products of our experience. So somehow along the way, your friend had experiences that that formulated his opinions about things. Why? You know, the, the big question in our, our minds, I think, is why? Can, if we can, if we can seek to understand why about each other and remain in that space of curiosity, then we may not ever change each other's minds, but we're not giving license for the other person to have a knee jerk reaction of defensiveness, right? Because we're, we're open. We're open. Yes. And once you engage somebody and deeply listen to them and acknowledge their thoughts, you can really start coming together in a way where uh, they'll also listen to you. So Mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing. But then beyond that, beyond talk, what is very important to do. And the next step, the the rest of the book is basically about not just talking the talk. It's about walking the walk. Mm -hmm. Because when you illustrate 
how to show up at the supermarket with your market bags, which many people are doing now, which is great. The other people who maybe haven't, you know, gotten into that wonderful habit are going to see that and go, oh man, I forgot mine again, you know, and then they can also rise to this very first step in mm -hmm. addressing, mm -hmm. you know, better choices when you're shopping. And then the next time they go, you know, maybe they see you being very careful not to put anything wrapped in plastic into your cart. And here's a cool thing, the little net bags that limes come in and things mm -hmm. like that. You can, you know, right now people are marketing like vegetable bags and that's cool, but you know what? You already have them and you've probably been throwing them into recycling. Those net bags, go ahead and turn them inside out. And those can be your new bags to put produce in when you go to the market. Another thing you can do with those net bags, and you should do this anyways, if you do throw them out, you always want to tie them in a knot so no wildlife will get stuck in them. And what I do is I take little ones, big ones, and I bunch them up and then stuff them into a smaller net bag that perhaps garlic came in, tie it. And this is an awesome scrubby. I do that yeah. too. I love the scrubbiness of it. Yeah, it I works do out. too. It works and really well. And it's beyond a sponge because sponges are so disgusting. And they, they are also a lot of times made of fossil fuels. They're not going to biodegrade and they get so funky. You know, this little scrubby thing is perfect and it yeah. just rinses out. Perfect. Yeah, no, I loved some of the suggestions in your book. I mean, the book goes really into detail about what you can do in your kitchen and your bathroom and yada, yada, yada. It was, it was very, very detailed. And a lot of those things I'm doing, I've been on this journey for a while, but there were so many things I didn't think about. The idea that go for takeout or when you have your meal and you're bringing home your, your doggy bag, right? That your dog's not going to eat, but you're going to eat. Instead of the, taking the container, asking them for waxed paper, that would never have occurred to me. I'm always like, when they bring the container, I'm like, oh, I should have brought my own container. But wax paper, of course they have wax paper in the kitchen. Of course they do. Or parchment yep. paper or whatever. Um, or Reynolds wrap either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, a neat thing, and uh, I think that this whole movement, of course, it's exciting because we've got to do it because the earth needs it. But on a creative level, as a creative, I love the alternatives and knowing, you know, when we see something that we're uncomfortable with, like when somebody brings you, the waitress brings you this polystyrene container and you're like, no, <laughs> you know, um, you just think, okay, wait, what are the alternatives? And that idea came when I was sitting at a bar with my husband and we were talking to the people next to us, yak, yak, yak. And we had a few Buffalo chicken wings left over. And uh, I said, oh man, you know, I just, I hate to waste food. And I asked for the, the wax paper and it was so cool because when they brought it, I just, you know, twisted it up. It was fine. And the people on either side of me were like, oh, that's such a good idea. Mm -hmm. And they didn't look like people who would be really even that concerned about environment. But I think really deep down, everybody is, no matter what your politics, I think you know what's right and what's wrong. And I think a lot of times, you know, going back to people who, you know, disagree or act in a certain way, or maybe even don't want to address the environmental situation because it's too painful and they don't understand what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a big one. It just helps to take little steps in the right direction. And well, that's kind of what the book is about too. Yeah. I, I like you the idea of you're planting seeds with, with every action or inaction that other people observe. Yes. You're planting seeds. And that's, and that is a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And you can't take on the climate crisis in a great big hairball because it is a million different things mm. coming together mm -hmm. to have created this quagmire that we're stuck in. But, you know, take that sentence apart. And the quagmire was created by us, us choosing these things that yes, they were marketed to us, but ultimately we're responsible. Mm. We're the ones that bought, you know, the hair conditioner again in this big bottle. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can make it, you can make mm -hmm. your own hair conditioner, you can make your own toothpaste, to mouthwash. And then if everybody, you know, started doing that, the mouthwash is one of my favorites, because it's so easy, baking soda, distilled water, maybe four drops of tea tree oil, and maybe six drops of peppermint essential oils. And it's great, you shake it up, 
and um, it just feels so good. And think of all of those plastic bottles no longer flowing into the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the landfills and into, mm -hmm. into everybody's recycling bins, which as we know now, recycling was something that was put out by fossil fuels so that we would feel good about continuing to buy all of this stuff in plastic. Yeah. 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 I'm, I spend winters here in California and, and it's really been disturbing to me to walk along the beaches and see the microplastic. It's not yeah. even just, it's not even bottle caps. It's not even tampon applicators. It's, it's little tiny, very colorful. The waves come in and when they recede, they leave this line of, mm. of tiny little plastics that, you know, birds, fish are ingesting at the bottom of the food chain, ingesting it into ourselves. I mean, I think I've, I think they found, I think they've found evidence of different kinds of toxins from plastics in breast milk. I mean, it's, Absolutely. it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. plastic bags at the bottom of the Mariana trench. I mean, it's like, okay, seriously, people, seriously, we, we need to wake up about it. So, well, I think again, you know, everybody's thinking, okay, we've got to legislate this and it is being legislated here in Maryland. We're, you know, we're on the brink of getting rid of all those flimsy plastic bags and things like that. And mm -hmm. um, I think a polystyrene was banned at least in Baltimore and some other big cities last year. So this is all good, but that's once again, we're waiting as individuals for big brother, or big sister to kind of tell us what to do. So that is why your friend there in England who just released her book and, uh, you know, she's my best friend here because yeah, this is this is exactly what I'm talking about bottom up change. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you don't do top down legislation as well and work very hard. But right now, today, any of us can start to, you know, walk the walk for bottom up change. And that's exciting, I think. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I Are think there... a lot of the stress and anxiety that people feel, especially young people, is because they feel caged in and like they don't have any ability to get themselves out of this horrible vice of all of the marketing and all of the product that's coming at them that they feel they have to use and buy, that there's no alternatives. But yet there are. And then that's empowering. And, you know, once you start taking uh, control of things like that. It, it's very centering. It's very good for you. Yeah. I think I see the anxiety thing to extrapolate that a little bit more as we've lost our connection with earth. You know, we, we, we feel like we're in it alone and that's why coming together. I mean, we feel like what difference can I make as an individual? Well, I can't make any difference, so I'm not going to do anything at all. It's scary when we look at the large overlooming crisis. It's an existential crisis, but by banding together and doing the little things together, there's power. Big power. Yeah. I mean, if you just take like milk cartons, when I was growing up, the milk still came in a glass bottle, which was really aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. And uh, imagine all of the plastic milk cartons that come into our lives to try to even come up with a size element, you know, so that you could imagine the amount of milk containers that are manufactured and used daily, and then go to uh, the landfill. Imagine if instead at the grocery store, they were to, you buy a lovely milk bottle, a glass milk bottle. I even have one actually in my cupboard and um, I take to the farmer's market sometimes. And then they just have a machine that the supermarket could have that's full of, heck, almond milk or, you know, 2% milk, skim milk, what have you. And you just take your bottle, you know, you carry bottles out of the grocery store. Why not carry one in mm -hmm. and fill up your milk bottle? And right there, my goodness, that's like a major thing mm -hmm. if everybody mm -hmm. stopped buying milk in those gigantic plastic cartons. Ditto for laundry soap. Those things are horrendous, those great big vats. And what you're doing is you're paying for the water because before this, people just used, I think it's washing soda and borax, which work great together and they're better for the environment. And you can still buy them at the grocery store. They're still you there. You sure can. Yeah. And they're cheap and there's no water in them. So you, you know, you're, you're paying, I think I paid like maybe three fifty or $4 per box for that. It'll last you for so long because you only need a little bit per load. And yet 
you know, you have to keep going back and buying these big vats of plastic full of laundry soap and these evil little pods and plastic and things like that. Yeah. It's just yeah. manufacturing and trying to make a buck bottom yeah. line. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we bought into convenience and the convenience of things has enslaved us. We need to go back to simple things, just like the whole minimalist thing happened, you know, less is more. Less is more. Why, why do you need a, underneath your kitchen sink? Why do you need 55 different kinds of cleaning things? You don't. Yep. That's just for, you know, these businesses to make a profit. And when you walk into the grocery store and there's an entire aisle of variations on mm -hmm. cleaners and things like that, once again, every single one of those is requiring a different single use plastic container. And you can make those yourself. And the perceived convenience factor, that was really an interesting thing when I was writing the book. It was fun to research it. And I learned about, for instance, um, razors back in the day. Mm, you know, men used mm -hmm. to just have a straight razor that they shaved with. And then I think the guy was named, well, his last name was Gillette. It's kind of something funny like King Gillette, a strange first mm -hmm, name, mm -hmm. came, came up with disposable razors. And then this guy, Marcel Beck, took that one step further and said, oh, no, even better. We'll have disposable razors. So not our, you're not just disposing of the metal blade. We're going to throw the whole thing out. And razors is an example of a multi-material product, the plastic, the metal. It's not recyclable. Right. So those go, you know, right into being discarded and they're dangerous and we do not need them. And it's so much more expensive to go and buy a, a bag of disposable razors than just reusing a razor. So it's not, it's not more convenient. It's they're marketing it to us as if, as if it is, but you still have to go to the store and buy the thing over and over and over again. True. True. Well, this has been fascinating. I, I love all your ideas. I think um, the book is incredible. And so thank you for doing this. I think you said this is the first of a series of books. Is that right? Yeah, there's been such a good reaction to the, um, like the recipe section of the book, you know, where it, you know, you can make mainly uh, beauty care, personal care products and um, cleaning products. I didn't really get into food, but now the next book is going to be on food. Like, you, oh, you're out of ketchup? Well, here's a recipe for that because all of these big companies, they make their stuff from recipes. Mm -hmm. Recipes are the basis of everything. And if they can make it, we can make it. And the difference with um, large companies and commercial products a lot of the time is the original recipes were made with more natural products. But when a commercial entity is going to make it, they're going to try to get as much profit out of it as they can. And a lot of times they'll substitute more chemical based items instead of the natural ones so that they can make a little more money. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes when you look at a commercial or a processed food, it's got all this extra stuff in it, but it, it doesn't need to be there. And it's better for you if it's not. Okay. So that's another asset, um, you know, a plus for making things yourself. You're controlling what you, you are putting into your body, bringing into your household and feeding your family. And ultimately the stuff that goes down the drain, you're rinsing off that's going into your aquifer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the problem is everywhere. That's, I think that's part of the overwhelm is that when you look at it and you start following the golden thread, it's in every, every aspect of our entire paradigm. And so, yeah, we need to put our heads together and work together. Yep. And making some of these things, people might say, oh, it takes too much time. And they really don't. It's kind of funny. I mean, I have a bread recipe. I throw it together. There's like, I don't know, four or five elements in it every morning. I, I put it together, two cups of bread flour, one cup of whole wheat, a half a cup of flax meal. I like to put in there. That's an optional thing. And then a teaspoon of yeast, teaspoon of sugar, half a teaspoon of salt, and then a cup and a half of warm water, mix it up, you know, knead it for a little bit, put it on the counter until, you know, like you come home at night throw it into the oven at 425. And, um, and also the secret is have a little metal bowl of water that you put the water in and all the steam goes shush, and it makes a fabulous crust. 
I can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. And it's so easy. And then, well, there you go. You save yourself, you know, $4 on a loaf of bread every other day. No plastic around that bread can make all kinds of alternative ingredients in there. That's a lot of fun. I think that's one of the gifts of COVID is that it, we've had to slow down. And because we've had to slow down, we've found time to be more creative. Not all of us are creatives like you are. And we were on this treadmill of, you know, running faster, faster, faster all the time to fit more in, to buy more stuff. This is kind of, we've had to hit the pause. We didn't do it. Mother nature did it for us. Yeah. She, she gave us pause and you couldn't hide from yourself. So you really had to assess what was valuable. Absolutely. It seems that we don't have to get on planes or commute to work every day and that we can communicate and get up with old friends, you know, through Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps there's pluses in every minus and this, the minuses on COVID are, of course, extreme and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Heartbreaking. Absolutely. But we did need a good slap to the head and uh, say kick in the butt. But yes. OK, <laughs> all of the above. Yeah. And, and it, it is cool because we are coping and humans are extremely adaptable. And this now, I think we only need to understand the path we need to be walking down. And I think that that is the huge ray of light that's hit us right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, environment is big time on everybody's plates. I think the time is now. Well, so let's segue that into, we always do our closing with some good news. And this week I... President Biden and Trudeau talking and agreeing to put environmental issues on the forefront. And that just seemed like exceptionally good news. You said that you've got some local stuff that's happening on the environmental news that you wanted to share. Absolutely. With all of the different things that's been going on in Washington and uh, people sort of showing their true colors, we've had a representative and the lines uh, are drawn very curiously here in Maryland, where we have a fellow in Baltimore um, that is basically making decisions for the Eastern Shore, which is a very rural area. Huh. He's a Republican. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of Republicans on the shore, and that's fine. You know, some, some things are good. But environmentally, this person, Andy Harris, has been atrocious and has pretty much voted 99.9 .9 against anything remotely and positive for the environment for years and years and years. And he's just been impossible to get out. But, you know, he waltzed in uh, to work the other day in Congress with his um, gun. <laughs> nice. So nice. That, that, uh, a lot of people's eyes opened on that. And now there's a, uh, actually a lot of energy to try to get him out. And hopefully we can get a more centerist person logically thinking about the future of everyone mm -hmm. um, to step up and we can we can get some good representation of the environment to go forward. Definitely voting is is one of our superpowers. Spending and voting. Yes. Super, superpowers for the environment. Absolutely. The next step is an action tip. So what what is one suggestion you think that that you would suggest that people make. All right, let's see. I have been having fun <laughs> and we'll see if that continues with the stock market oh. because it's sort of my hobby like knitting where I wanted to invest my, I had my money invested with a financial guy for years and years and years. Well, they actually take a pretty hefty chunk I sure. learned. Yep. And so now I've gone with, um, there's a lot of different people like Vanguard or, um, Fidelity or some of these other companies. And I, I want to know about the companies I'm investing in. Mm -hmm. So I've been having kind of a great time researching around and I've built my own portfolio of alternative energy stocks and then other companies that are assisting with alternative energy. So it might, you know, go all the way back to the people who are making the software or the pipes or the, you know, the elect the solar modules. And it's really fun because this is an exciting time in invention wise, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, 
as Biden says, there are a million jobs in the environment. And this is a time inventors and young people and uh, outside of the boxers can really get their ideas out there and think of them. There's a fabulous product. I love, you know, tides. I have to watch out for the tide when I'm trying to get home sometimes. So I always think, well, that's a constant, you know, the rushing in and out of water, that's the moon controlling that. So there's a buoy that's called a smart buoy that generates energy by the movement of water. Interesting. You know, there's so many fantastic biomimicry type um, products and energy sources coming out. So this is kind of fun. You learn about them and then you invest and support those businesses at the base so that they can bring a better way to sustainably live to everybody. And who knows, you could make some money. Yeah. I, I want to connect you with a, a gentleman that I had on as an, um, for an interview a few weeks ago. His name is Craig Jonas, and he has started a company called CoPeace. They're a holding company. They actually in, invest in, in companies that are changing the world. I'll give you his link. I, I will love I found, it. I found him pretty fascinating. You know, we're all looking for ways to make a difference. And he was, our conversation was very interesting because journey is not a straight line. Like none of us, ours is right. But as his children got older, he realized what was important to them. He saw them researching everything before they would buy a product. And he was like, he decided consciously to make the decision to parlay all of his successes in team building and yada, 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 to create a team of people around investing for, for the greater good. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. That's how it should be. Because why invest in things that are bad for you? Exactly. We put our trust outside. We need to be putting on our thinking caps and critical thinking skills. Yeah. have not been valued here in the States. The last step of our closure is a sanity tip. So when you get overwhelmed by what's happening out there, how do you stay sane? Well, I'm very fortunate because I, I live on the Chesapeake Bay and um, I'm way out in the middle of nowhere. And I love it. You know, it's, it's pretty great. And I'm never lonely. I feel like I have a million friends around me at all times. I just go outside and take a walk and am quiet and listen to the world and birds and the wind and the song in the trees and uh, look out at the water and the light dancing on the water. And I just think, you know, this is the, this is life. You know, this is happiness. This is what ancient peoples did. You know, this was their joy. And I feel that the more we can get back to that, get out of our enclosed spaces, our, our cars, and truly appreciate this beautiful world. You know, that, that is just plain good for you. Yeah. Great. Great. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, thank you so much. I wish you the best for your book. Um, I will include links to you, your gorgeous ceramics uh, oh, thank and, you. and your book on the earth feels podcast page. And um, thanks for joining us. I hope to talk to you again. It's been a real pleasure. And likewise, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Okay. That's this week's episode of Earth Feels. Special thanks to singer-songwriter Kristen Hoffman for generously allowing us to use song for the ocean. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss an episode. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Children of the earth, I'm calling out. There's a mission for you and for me.